So I saw this thing on eBay, not a very good picture, rather poor description. All it said was CMI, Coating Measurement System, XRX series, that's pretty much it. Didn't really know what it was, it was it'd come from a factory clearance or something. Um, did a little bit of hunting on the net and there was a suggestion that it might have something to do with x-rays or so on and it, uh, it went for peanuts, I think the shipping actually cost more than the, uh, the unit. So. Um, the picture wasn't that detailed, it actually looked like it was sort of something about the size of a scanner, but actually it sort of turned out to be quite a bit bigger than that and turned up on a pallet. Um, but um, so it cost almost nothing, it looks uh, looked quite interesting and got uh, confirmation and yes there is uh, something vaguely x-ray-ish in there, but it's not it's not like ridiculously heavy, it's not packed full of lead, so um, yeah it's not, if this was like a, you know, a big x-ray thing you, you wouldn't be able to lift it but it's sort of just about liftable on its pallet. So um, let's take a look. Yeah, the most obvious feature is that there's um, an XY table here. Um, I gather this is for measuring characteristics of things like platings and coatings, possibly even foil on PCBs um, using extra, I think X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy spectroscopy. Um, almost no user interface. This is clearly designed to be used in conjunction with um, an external PC or something because there's uh, just a bunch of sort of D connectors on the back. So I'm sure these would have gone into probably some either custom or off-the-shelf data acquisition cards. Um, there's actually a video output connector and there's a little camera inside there. Um, so there's no realistic pro chance of actually getting this to do anything useful because obviously without the PC in the, in the interface card it wouldn't you know, it would be uh, pretty useless. So um, I think it's just time to uh, take the pieces and see what's inside it. Yeah, it's got a test date here of 2002 and a calibration due of uh, 03. So this has probably been sort of just sat somewhere for sort of the last 10 years or so doing nothing, I would guess. Serial number just says CMI. That's probably the company internal serial number rather than uh, the manufacturers. Obviously, this is a bit. This will be a very sort of specialised piece of kit. Although yeah, it has got a sort of custom moulded um, plastic case, so uh, I'd imagine this is probably something that had a price tag well into five figures when it was uh, new. Highly specialised, expensive piece of kit, which is uh, just the sort of thing we like. Um, there's like a little window here, so obviously whatever it is you're measuring goes in here and then this table can move it around so it can scan around it. And you can see all sorts of uh, interesting bits and pieces in there. And this lid is actually uh, made out of fiberglass, obviously for a very low uh, volume uh, piece of kit like this. They probably yeah, um, laid this up over a wooden moulding or something, obviously you wouldn't use an injection moulding for the sort of volumes and size for something like this. But you can actually see it's uh, fiberglass, so quite, yeah, quite nicely finished. And there's a date there of uh, 1997. And there's actually some pieces of this is just chipboard. There's a presumably a stiffener on there, so you don't often see wood inside uh, precision equipment, but uh, this one you do. Again, it's just something that was no doubt the most appropriate solution for the you know these this sort of kit's probably made in at the very most hundreds, if not tens, quantity. So. Uh, case of uh, whatever's the most practical uh, solution to uh, do a nice looking case because obviously if people are paying a fortune for a bit of kit they want it to look nice. And not a huge amount of electronics inside, we've got this big um, x-ray power supply by Spellman that's a um, 0-50kV 1.5 milliamp x-ray power supply. Um, all the interesting bits are in this mechanical assembly. There's um, a motor on here. This basically moves. This whole assembly moves up and down um, to change the distance to the uh, sample. Um, there's really very little other electronics. We've got a main transformer and just a little board here with a few little power supply bits and pieces. But obviously everything else is going out to the um, this connector on the back. Um, there's a little box here which I'm. I would almost certainly say is a photomultiplier power supply. So we've got DC in and a coax connection out in a shielded box. Now this whole assembly does look like it's actually meant to lift out. I think we need to disconnect the cables first. Yeah, I think when you unplug that, this, this whole lot will come out in one, one piece. And uh, this thing does actually just sit on the XY. The XY thing is a separate um, piece. I've taken all the screws out. This does actually now lift off. Mm. 
So you know, I've just got the um, XY table and this, this plate comes off. And um, so we've got two stepper motors here, X and Y, and there's just two um, off-the-shelf stepper drivers. I couldn't find much information online, it just says there are a two two. so these have got their own dedicated connector, so again that probably goes off to a, an interface card on the, uh, the PC to drive the motors. The only connection to the main unit is a power connection there. Nothing interesting about these, they're just sort of intelligent stepper drivers, some limit switches on the ends, and that's pretty much all there is in here. And these are uh, standard 200 step stepper motors. The, um, this thread is, I guess, about a 4mm pitch or so. So the step resolution is about sort of the order of 0.02mm, which is sort of fairly fine. This runs on the, the, some sort of ball bearing rollers here and the, also to um, support this. So this is probably quite a nice little XY table for maybe a DIY laser cutter or something. I'll probably stick this whole um, table assembly on eBay as a complete item. It might be useful for somebody uh, wanting to make an XY something or other. It's probably not, for, not any good for machining because it's not really designed for mechanical strength but for something like a, um, a you know, laser cutter with a static uh, laser that would probably work quite nicely. There's a couple of interesting variations on BNCs. This is a high voltage. I've seen these, these before. This is a high voltage one, which is for the photomultiply power supply. But I've not seen one of these before. I think there's a little sort of gold insert. So I think it might actually be a triaxial, although it only appears to be connected to uh, a two core cable. I think it might be an outer shield and then two uh, inner cores. I've uh, not seen that before. Right now that's come out, the only thing that's left is a little laser module here, a little red laser module which is yeah, presumably for alignment and there's uh, not really much else. Um, looking at what's on here, this is yeah, pretty certain this is almost all just power supply and a few odd bits of interconnect, there's really nothing, uh, nothing obvious in terms of, sort of functionality going on down here, this is all going to be done on the uh, PC card. Interesting little detail on the high voltage connection to the X-ray tube. Um, instead of using sort of high, fancy, expensive high voltage connectors, they seem to have adapted sort of off the shelf things. So the actual cable is um, coax, yeah, very thick um, RG8 coax. And on the power supply end, they sort of seem to have used the coupling part from a PL259 with obviously a long tube for clearance and just a 4mm connector so that just sort of goes, goes all the way in there and then gets screwed in. And on the, uh, the back of the x-ray tube they seem to have basically done the same thing but with some sort of military circular connector and again sort of going through a long tube with a 4mm connector on the end. Obviously that, you know, a huge amount of uh, creepage distance across here so they don't, it's, it's not um, oil sealed, it's, it feels like a fairly snug fit but it certainly wouldn't be airtight so they just have a massive great clearance to avoid um, Voltage, uh, so high voltage breakdown over that. But this is, you know, pretty much standard cable using sort of combination of pretty much off the shelf connectors instead of exotic high voltage ones. Just take a quick look at this uh, power supply. Um, fairly straightforward. I did actually find the manual for this online, and um, <clears throat> because it's designed for sort of precision lab type applications, it's actually got very good stability spec. It's 0.01%. Um, regulation and in fact you can see there's an analog devices AD581 uh, precision reference here which is not something you normally see in a, straight, um, a conventional power supply but other than that it looks fairly conventional you've got this big again um, because it's designed for you know, precision lab instruments you've got this huge great filter it's actually a double section filter um, and then a fairly straightforward looking switch mode power supply front end you've got um, NTC for inrush limiting rectifier some more filtering you can see some uh, slots in the board to improve the uh, creepage distance here and also down there reservoir cap and then this goes down underneath this is the main so this is all just potted obviously for the high voltage so this will be the um, uh, main transformer and also a voltage multiplier in here but other than that it's relatively straightforward and obviously this is all the control stuff there's just a bunch of uh there's a pwm controller here and there's just a bunch of op amps and various other analog stuff here so um and this is generally you know you, you specify your voltage there's a one to ten volt input on here so you tell it how many 
KV you want out via that. All right, so a quick look around this thing before we start tearing it to bits. Um, this is the front, we've got the fan over here, this is clearly the uh, x-ray tube. There's what looks like a solenoid here, I'm guessing that's probably a shutter, that sort of pulls a shutter in and out of the uh, beam. There's a little temperature indicator label on the side of that, because obviously this is probably going to get quite hot, so I'm going to keep that cool. Um, there's a video camera which is pointing downwards, there's some additional optics further down there. Um, there's a pretty big stepper motor, this actually drives um, these, there's some uh, three lead screws here to uh, move the whole thing up and down, and in fact that, that's actually geared down, there's, there's a sort of tooth belt drive which gears it down and quite a fine pitch thread, so the up and down movement is actually pretty precise, it's probably, you know, pretty small fractions of a millimetre, I can't be bothered to actually work out what it is, but it's, um, you know, 200 step motor that's geared down probably by a factor of four, and then a quite a narrow pitch thread, so we're probably talking into the few microns per step vertical positioning, and this, you know, these are sort of big sleeved lead screws, so this, the up down side of things is, clearly looks very precise, and, um, sort of high resolution. There's another stepper down here, um, I'm not sure what that does, we'll turn it over in a minute. And then sort of around the back there's a couple of little boards, I think those are maybe stepper drivers or something, sort of one there and there's one similar looking board here, and that's the back of the x-ray tube. Interesting, this triaxial connector, I was wondering what that was, um, I can only assume it's for the filament, but I measured across it and it measures open circuit, obviously it could be that this is, this is a dead tube, um, but I'll have to investigate that a little bit further, but this yeah, K actually comes out just to a two core connector, so I was assuming that was going to be the filament, but um, it measures open circuit. Yeah, there's quite a lot more visible under here. Um, this I'm guessing is a photomultiplier tube for the detection, so the actual X-ray comes out here, there's a little um, collimator nozzle here which will pull apart a little bit more to take a closer look at. Um, there's also this stepper here, sort of moves this assembly, which looks like it selects one of two different nozzles on the X-ray machine. There's a, and the hole in that's just a tiny little pinhole, sort of, sort of maybe 0.2 millimetre or so on down diameter. So this is clearly doing a, an extremely small beam, which would also explain why there's no lead. Yeah, there's no lead shielding at all um, on this thing. There's a big array of LEDs for illumination. Now that camera, the video camera, points downwards. I assume there's probably going to be a mirror in here, and there's a second mirror here. There's two little um, cute little bulbs next to it. And I'm a bit curious as to why the, we've got an array of LEDs and bulbs, but it could be these LEDs are sort of side firing to sort of graze the surface, so you can see any scratches on the um, surface of whatever you're measuring, and the x-ray thing actually fires through the mirror, so the camera's obviously looking exactly at the point that the uh, x-ray's firing, so if you're measuring something you need to know exactly which part of it you're making the measurement of. Um, there's also a laser diagonally here, so I'm guessing that's producing either a dot or a cross or something on the, um, the target. And also on this photomultiplier there's a rotary thing, now this looks like it's got different metal foils, these are actually labelled um, that one says uh, it's V, so that's presumably vanadium. This one says Ni, presumably nickel, and this one CO, which I'm presuming is cobalt. And then there's a, an open window here. So um, I think yeah, the principle of X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy is pretty much the same as normal spectroscopy. You know, you fire a, a, a source at it. You, the molecule, molecules start bouncing up and down and um, emit different wavelengths, so these act as different filters, so by taking measurements of these different filters it can get some information about the various uh, wavelengths that are being bounced out from the um, target and produce information as to the composition and thickness of that uh, target. Um, this, back, this box back here, I'm sure this will be the um, first stage amplifier for the photomultiplier tube, but so this is all pretty much packed together so I think it needs some fairly serious taking apart to take a close look at all the bits it's made up from. Right, so the top lid, nothing too interesting, we've got the two stepper motors, motor drivers, these are UCN 
5804 drivers, nothing really special. So this is the main motor that does the lifting up and down. A couple of uh, tooth belts. Actually, a little bit more here again. So this is the video camera, X-ray tube, and shutter solenoid, and fan. Bottom here, we can get a slightly clearer view of what's in here. So, we've got this stepper motor driving this filter wheel around the uh, photomultiplier. Uh, stepper driver driving that. And so, what looks like a rather over the top mechanism for switching those two collimators in front of the x ray tube, we've got a sort of stepper motor. <coughs> Down here, that looks like some fairly sort of precise, looks like a fairly precise sort of linear bearing sort of thing here. But I'm guessing the position of those collimators are probably quite critical if they're doing very narrow beams. So this needs to be very mechanically stable. So you can see the end of the mechanical slide there, and there's a couple of optical slotted sensors here to detect when it's in the right position. These are just the veins that go into these two uh, two sensors here. Now they do seem to be quite concerned about the temperature of this x-ray tube because we've got this um, we've got the fan behind it. There's This is either a thermal trip or a temperature sensor and there's this temperature indicating label that changes colour when it goes over a certain temperature. So it looks like this has got up to about 54. So if we just heat that up with the soldering iron we should see that yeah, it just goes dark over a certain temperature. Um, the power supply rate, I don't know what this is actually run at, but the power supply 50 kV at 1.5 milliamps, so that's potentially dissipating 75 watts, so that will get quite hot if it's run for quite a long time. But also because that collimator has got such a small hole th through it, you know, almost all the energy is going to be absorbed in that. You're only going to get a tiny, tiny proportion of the um, output power coming through that uh, collimator, so it's going to be ridiculously inefficient. So you need to put quite a lot of power in to get any use amount of um, x-rays out the end of it. Now I thought this lead board was just illumination, but it's actually got quite a lot on it. Some HC138s on here, so this is probably designed to light one lead in turn. And there's actually a couple of what look like um, guessing photodiodes or phototransistors over here. So I wonder if that's maybe taught to illuminate it from a different direction to maybe look at scratches or something using the camera. Or yes, or some sort of surface marking that's dependent on the direction of the illumination. Um, so you cut the push buttons on there. Um, these connections here, these seem to go around to the, um, the photodiodes. So a couple of, a few switches, I think these are just limit switches for uh, detecting if the thing's actually hitting the, uh, the top. So there's these two little lamps here as well, bulbs. Yeah, I've just put 5 volts on this, um, the LEDs light up, I think they're actually scanning across, so I can see a slight flicker and I sort of I do that, you can see a sort of diagonal motion. Um, the buttons just seem to change the brightness a bit. But I think that's doing a sort of progressive scan across the LEDs. Actually, it looks like those buttons are mounted. There's some slight springs on these mount these mounts, so it's looking looks like that those switches are designed to operate when this board gets sort of pushed down. There's also something going on with these switches, I'm not quite sure what. So what we'll do now is take a look at the output from this camera. I just powered it up and as expected it's looking at a fairly small scale. So that's a 0.4mm grid. So I've got a 10 millimeter or so field of view. And this is quite a nice little um, lens on this camera, just taking the camera out because it's going through that uh, mirror thing. It's actually got quite a decent working distance, so when it's in focus, it's got about sort of 60 or 70 mil working distance. So it's potentially quite a useful little. Uh, microscope camera. 
Right, this whole optical block here just seems to be attached to the um, this output thing from the uh, X-ray tube, so that's clearly the mechanical reference. And so we've got these two different um, collimators that can be switched through. This looks like a block of brass that this is made of. See these look like they screw on as yeah, so these are sort of screw on, so they're probably two yeah, different versions of these depending on the application. And they've got I can barely see a hole in that and that one I can see a tiny little hole. No, you might just be able to see that. This one I'm not sure if there's actually a hole in there at all. If it is, it's very, very tiny. I think maybe there isn't. No, I don't think there's actually a hole. Oh, maybe there is. It's... Yeah, I think there's a tiniest, tiny, tiny little hole through that one. So it's probably, I don't know, one under point one millimetre or so. I'll take it off. I'll see if I can see some light through it. Of course with x-rays you can't focus them, so the only way to produce a really tiny spot is to basically shine it through a very small tube, which of course is very inefficient, so the, you know, it's not surprising there's no extra lead around there, because the amount of x-rays that would get through this would be you know, minuscule. I guess there's maybe some lead lining on the tube assembly itself, but uh, by the time it gets here there's so little x-ray, it's just uh, zero hazard. Right, so I've uh, got a bit deeper into this to the detector. So here we had this rotating filter assembly with the different um, metal foils. I was fully expecting to see something like a photomultiplier and a you know, some sort of scintillator in here, but what we have is this. There's only a single connection here. Um, I'm wondering if that's covering a gas seal or something. So if it's a sort of a tube in there. Um, looking at the electronics. Looks like we've got a sort of high voltage feed. This whole sort of side of the case is potted, um, and it looks like we've got sort of high voltage supply with some series resistors going to the tube. So I wonder if there's actually something like a um, a Geiger Muller tube or some other sort of gas discharge tube that uh, reacts to the X-rays. Um, not sure. I mean that it's got a. That's clearly not a gas seal there, that's just silicone around there. So I wonder if there's sort of metal shielding and there's a glass tube of some sort inside. In fact, yeah, there's no manufacturer's name or anything on here, so I'm guessing there's probably some additional covering on this. But I'd be very interested to know what this actually is. Right, peeled off some of the uh, tape and I found this LND ink. We specialise in the manufacture of radiation detectors. And it looks like it's one of these, a side window proportional counter for X-rays. And in fact, this is say uh, this is four nine, sorry four five four nine five. We've actually got some information on it. So it's a xenon gas filled counting tube, beryllium window. And it's sensitive to x-rays from 2 up to 34 kV, which is the sort of range we'd expect for this sort of application. It's always nice when you find something you never even knew existed before. And finally we get down to the actual um, x-ray tube. Now so we've got a shutter assembly on here, this is just a solenoid that opens and closes obviously for um, precision equipment, you don't want to be turning the tube on and off all the time because it's going to need to stabilise so I'm sure this just runs the tube continuously and then just uses this to turn it on and off when required. There's a lead and a photodiode here, I'm sure that's just to verify the shutter position. It's pretty heavy so I'm guessing there's either some lead or some other you know, fairly significant metal shielding in here. And this unit, this shutter unit is a completely separate piece that just comes off. Um, might just be able to see the uh, shutter in there. Can't see the right through. I suspect this, there might be some more collimation or filtering or something going on in this uh, end piece here. And here we can actually see the uh, tube window. It's a pretty brilliant window. 
Oh, I've actually found some information on this tube. It's actually quite a nice tube. It's um, sort of completely self-shielded, um, but very small spot size. So, I mean, this would be ideal for taking sort of X-ray photos of interesting small stuff. But unfortunately, the uh, filament appears to be open circuit, which is a real pain. So it's stainless steel lead line package, um, 50 watts, 10 to 50 kV. Um, with a 50 micron spot, which so that would have been really nice for getting some more details on stuff, but um, unfortunately um, it appears to have a dead filament, which is uh, really, really annoying. Might be worth take, oh, and I'll take it apart anyway because there's no, it's no use as it is, and it's conceivable there's an internal thermal fuse, but uh, that's possibly a bit too much to, uh, too much to hope for. Right, let's take a look at this uh, tube. Um, this thing here saying do not exceed 55 degrees C. I suspect that's because of pressure build-up of the oil inside. Um, it was what what looks actually like a tyre filling valve um, there, which is probably used for filling the um, filling in it. Perhaps also as a vent or something. So let's see what lies inside. I finally managed to extricate this tube from this massive, disgusting silicone jelly goop. Um, you see, it's got a metallic, it's a beryllium window that passes uh, soft X rays, which beryllium is quite toxic, but it's only a major issue if it's a powder, so uh, the metal itself isn't uh, too bad. There's actually there's a warning in the data sheet about avoiding getting condensation on that window because apparently it can actually cause it to sort of corrode and disintegrate and. Uh, lose the vacuum and basically wreck the tube. Um, now there's some... the gunk feels a bit harder in the middle, I'm not sure if it's a different gunk or whether it's the same gunk that's just hardened over time, it sort of seems to crystallise, I think maybe that it's where it's got hot it's uh, crystallised or something. Um, so the casing is sort of lead lined as you'd expect. But this, this stuff is just revolting, it's just sort of sticky and jelly but slimy like sort of um, silicone sealer. It's horrible stuff. Let's see if I can uh, get a bit more off and clean this up a bit. Well, I've got most of the gunk off of this thing. Um, so you can see it's quite a small, uh, small tube. Um, you can see the target, it's a tungsten target, an angle there, the electron gun here and then the uh, window. Interesting there's a sort of line across here which I'm guessing is the effect of x-rays on the glass. Um, also notice the glass has got a very slight brown tinge. Um, I think the reason for this is that they ha the glass has an additive to make it very very slightly conductive to prevent um, a charge build up on the surface which can cause distortion of the uh, electron beam. Um, this is on the end, this, this will this serves two functions, it's partly a heat sink but also the sort of smooth curved surface avoid, um, is to avoid corona discharge from sharp points due to um, high charge concentration. This is just screwed into the end, this is the copper, uh, copper anode, um, it's, I think it's generally, uh, yeah, you can actually you might just be able to see that it's a copper anode for thermal conductivity and there's a sort of slug of, of um, tungsten on the surface which is the actual target that the electrons hit to produce the x-rays. Right, these disgusting gels all over the place. If someone knows of something that can dissolve and get rid of silicone effectively, please let me know because there's bits of it all over the place. It's uh, horrible. Right, so a quick look at this um, detector. Um, instantly, the reason it's called a proportional counter is that the output voltage is proportional to the energy of the um, photons hitting it. So um, you can actually use it to discriminate the actual. Um, wavelengths of the x-ray sitting, which is obviously useful in uh, spectroscopy type applications. Um, this power supply is pretty much as expected, it's a sort of positive assembly, just a little sort of switch mode front end, uh, transform and a voltage multiplier, so this, according to the data sheet, this is producing a couple of kV or so. It's a fairly standard diode capacitor voltage multiplier there. And so the amplifier, just got these through, these are going to be power, I'm sure that's almost certainly going to be plus minus 15 or so. So let's see if we can uh, hook it together and uh, see if we can detect any background radiation or anything with it. Well, this thing seems to be working, um, just picking up quite a lot of background particles and radiation. Um, I've got a piece of this is a, a uranium paint um, dish that's got a bit radioactive, so I'll hold that in front. 
be quite high count. Obviously, because this has got a brilliant window, it's quite sensitive to um, even quite soft particles. It's uh, certainly more sensitive than a standard GM tube, Geiger counter tube. And so you can see different pulse heights. So because this is a proportional tube, the pulse height actually represents the energy of the particle it's detecting. So it's detecting all sorts of different particles at different energies. Uh, quite neat. Right, I've just hooked up the, uh, this is the tube from the baggage x-ray machine. Now obviously this is a glass window tube so it won't emit very much at low voltage. And I've just got to get it connected up to a um, simple high voltage supply based on a TV flyback so this can't produce more than about 25 kV. Got a bit of filament current going so you can see it glowing. Connects it up to an audio amp to make it easy to hear. That's about 5 kV. And just to prove it's not just high voltage discharge, I put something in the way of it. So those are sort of very low energy X-rays, just being absorbed by uh, some paper. Let's see if I put lead through it and cover it stone dead. Put the scope trace on those. So that's just the background <coughs> signal. You see, one thing you see is the amplitude is pretty consistent. So the energy, the X-ray energy, this this power supply has got fairly high impedance. So as I increase, turn it up, it's actually just increasing the current rather than the voltage. So you see, the energy is actually quite consistent. If I turn the heater down. That will actually probably let me get the voltage a little bit more before the um, power supply limit. So I turn the heater down a bit and crank the voltage up. And it's not like a huge I think this, this power supply is topping out at about 6 kV or so. It's a bit hard to see any difference in amplitude based on. Um, voltage I'm giving you but I'm guessing the glass is probably filtering it to some extent so we're only getting a fairly narrow uh, range of wavelength through there. And of course you don't actually need an x-ray tube to generate x-rays, this is a big uh, transmitting tube, it's up the same way just fi firing up the filament, just apply uh, about 10 kV to the uh, anode. There we go, 